Right, so once again we are back and what we are going to talk about today is fatty acid synthesis. So fatty acid synthesis, we will talk about basically de novo bio synthesis or fatty acid. Alright? Now, as I've always advised you, the easiest way for you to understand metabolism is to think about the context, what is exactly happening in the body. You really want to think about is one in a well-fed state or are they in starvation? Think about that. It's going to help you largely to know what kind of reactions you're going to be expecting in every circumstance. So in this case, the process of fatty acid synthesis is going to occur mainly in a circumstance where you need to store energy. Remember, fatty acids are stored as triacylglycerols in the adipose tissue. And this is the manner in which energy is going to be stored. And this is going to be used when there is a need for energy. So fatty acid synthesis Basically, it's going to happen in a number of tissue, mainly in the liver and in lactating mammary glands. This is why you're going to see these processes occurring mainly. So briefly, I just want to introduce the circumstances that will lead to fatty acid synthesis. And these circumstances that I want to talk about are the fed circumstances. What happens when you eat your food? So, let's say you have eaten pap. That's on Shima, right? You know that this is a starch. It's going to be broken down in the mouth, and once it has been broken down into oligosaccharides, they are going to be swallowed, goes into the stomach, digestion of carbohydrates stop, get into the duodenum, where you are going to see further digestion with the help of pancreatic amylase. In the mouth, it was dilin, which is saliva amylase, and in the duodenum, pancreatic amylase. This is going to break down this carbohydrate and then once it has been broken down, it's going to be absorbed and it finds its way into the portal venous blood, right? Into the portal venous blood, it will give rise to the blood glucose concentration. So this carbohydrate which you have taken in is finding its way into the blood. What next? When the carbohydrate is in the blood, which is your glucose is in the blood, it will actually have its effect. And the effect it's going to have is to lead to secretion of the hormone insulin. I've always avoided to talk so much about this process, but just for today, since I've already been building on this, I want to detail this process a little bit. So you see, insulin is secreted from from what we call the endocrine pancreas, right? So the pancreas has two parts. It has what we call the endocrine pancreas, which is on the surface of the pancreas itself. Then there's what is called the exocrine pancreas, which is mainly made up of pancreatic acid itself. The primary difference between the endocrine and the exocrine is this. The endocrine is actually going to secrete its content directly into the blood. So this is going to be the hormones. <coughs> and then the exocrine, the contents are going to be secreted into a duct and then move probably into the duodenum and find its way inside there and digest your carbohydrates. All right? So from the first part, we said that when your food comes in, the pancreatic amylase, including the pancreatic juices, are going to be secreted. It raises the pH of, of, the, of the duodenum to about 6 to 8, and then it goes ahead to digest your carbohydrate there, right? The pH increase is done by the bicarbonates, which are part of the contents of the pancreatic juice. Now, once the digestion has occurred and then there is assimilation, the glucose which is absorbed is going to enter into the portal venous blood and ultimately it finds into 
itself in peripheral blood circulation. What would be the effect? Well, a rise in blood glucose would have the following effect. This glucose is actually going to diffuse into the beta cells of the pancreas. This time around, the glucose would find its way into the beta cells of the pancreas, which are a part of the endocrine pancreas. So the beta cells, these are the cells where insulin is produced. You could be aware that the islets of Langer hands has a number of cells. They are what we call the alpha cells, the beta cells, the gamma, the delta cells, and all of these secrete different things. For the sake of this lecture, I just want to talk about the alpha and the beta, the alpha and the beta, and particularly, I want to tell you that the beta cells will secrete the hormone insulin, the alpha cells will secrete the hormone glucagon. Now, here is what happens. Glucose enters into the beta cells through specialized transporters referred to as the GLUT2 transporters. It basically diffuses them. Once it diffuses into the beta cells, a series of reactions is going to occur, are going to occur. And some of these reactions would include the fact that once the glucose has entered into the beta cells, it's going to undergo breakdown, glycolysis, and lead to production of ATP. Once the ATP has been produced, this ATP would actually lead to the activation of ATP-sensitive potassium channels. These ATP-sensitive potassium channels are going to close. When they close, it leads to depolarization. And this depolarization would ultimately lead to activation of the voltage-gated calcium channels. And once the voltage-gated calcium channels are open, the influx of calcium into the beta cells would lead to secretion of the insulin vesicles. And this is how insulin is going to be secreted. Once the insulin has been secreted, it will then move. Insulin, once that's been secreted, is going to move and it will find itself into the peripheral tissue. Let's give an example of the muscle cell. This is one of the tissues that will actually receive this insulin. The insulin is going to bind onto its receptor. Now, briefly about the insulin receptor, this receptor which is usually referred to as an insulin receptor, has actually four subunits. Two of them are alpha subunits. So it would have the alpha subunits, like that, and these are joined by disulfide linkages to the beta subunit. So disulfide linkages, most likely these disulfide linkages you're seeing are actually produced by the amino acid cysteine. And this is in the membrane. So the way the membrane is, it's going to be like that. And you know that this is a phospholipid bilayer. <coughs> Alright? So this is how it sits. The alpha subunits outside here and the beta subunits inside there. Alright? So insulin itself, the hormone, is actually going to bind to the alpha subunit. The effect of the binding of insulin to the alpha subunit is that it will lead to conformational change in the beta subunit. What the beta subunit is this basically is a tyrosine kinase. So this has tyrosine kinase activity. The binding of insulin to the alpha subunit leads to conformational change, which will ultimately lead to autophosphorylation of the beta subunit such that this gets phosphate. Right? When the beta subunit has been autophosphorylated, this would then lead to conformational change, which will ultimately lead to phosphorylation of 
many other substances. Some of the things that will be phosphorylated include the insulin receptor substrate. Once the insulin receptor substrate has been phosphorylated and it has actually been worked on, it will ultimately lead to phosphorylation of many other enzymes which will be activated. Primarily, some of the enzymes that will be phosphorylated include the enzymes such as the protein, kinase B, and then there is also what I refer to as the phosphoprotein phosphatase. This is usually referred to as protein phosphatase 1. Ultimately, the effect that insulin is going to have is to lead to dephosphorylation primarily of most enzymes. So a number of enzymes are going to be dephosphorylated by insulin and this dephosphorylation of this enzyme is what we have been referring to as covalent modulation. Now, when covalent modulation occurs, it will render an enzyme either active or inactive, right? Some of the enzymes that we have talked about that will actually be activated following the phosphorylation includes enzymes such as glycogen synthase, the enzyme which synthesizes glycogen, right? While other enzymes which will also be activated following the phosphorylation would include enzymes such as phosphofructokinase 2, which you saw in glycolysis as the one that was producing uh, fructose 2, 6 bisphosphate, which leads to increase in glycolysis, right? The other enzyme would include enzymes such as the pyruvate, uh, pyruvate kinase and also enzymes in the pyruvate dehydrogenase, uh, pyruvate dehydrogenase complex. These enzymes are actually going to be uh, activated following the process of dephosphorylation. Now, with primary interest here, it is the enzyme called acetal CoA carboxylase. That's one. And then the second one is the enzyme called fatty acid synthase. These are the two enzymes which will ultimately get activated following the presence of insulin and following the process of dephosphorylation. Primarily, acetyl CoA carboxylase, which is the committing enzyme to fatty acid synthesis. I must tell you, the effect of insulin is going to radiate beyond just dephosphorylation of enzymes. One other thing it will do is that it will lead to increased transcription of enzymes, right? Whereby these two enzymes would start being produced a lot more. This explains why when you consume carbohydrates, many, such as starch, it will lead to increased storage of fat, simply because when you consume carbohydrates, you have a higher amount of glucose which will lead to higher amounts of insulin secretion and higher amounts of insulin secretion will lead to increased production of these two enzymes the enzymes that will lead to synthesis of fat you get the sense? and when you have more enzymes that will synthesize fat you will store fat more and this is why it's the 